from rock and roll to sailing in the rain via 46 years of fun in medical imaging, what got me into medical imaging and interventional sciences, failing and adapting to thrive. Please, <laughs> Dave, the floor is yours. Right, thank you very much, Julia. What, a, what an introduction. Um, you, you can hear me all right, can't you? Um, yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to, um, as Julia said, sort of tell a little bit of a story of some of the adventures I've got up to um, over my career. Um, so there'll be a little bit of introduction of how they got into medical image computing. Um, and then um, uh, the uh, relatively new centre um, that I've been involved with now at UCL, the Y Centre, and then just a couple of projects um, on the interventional sciences, um, uh, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. Um, and hopefully all that will fit into uh, roughly 45 minutes. I've got my clock here, look, uh, so Julia, so I don't... Uh, go on and drone on and on for hours and hours and hours without knowing what the time is. Um, right, so um, as Julia said, I came out of Oxford with a uh, natural science degree in physics. It's a fairly pure theoretical physics type degree. Um, so it doesn't really make you a, a terribly useful person. Um, so I decided what I was gonna do. And um, um, I decided to do a master's and I decided to sort of change um, a little bit um, what uh, my direction was. So I did a master's in radio biology. The motivation for that was um, interesting. Um, I'd become sort of concerned about um, nuclear weapons. I was going on all the marches at that time to try and get them banned. And I thought I ought to try and understand a little bit more about what the effect of radiation was. Uh, so I went and did a master's in radio biology. Um, I think at that time, 1975, um, there was um, sort of reduction a bit in tension. Um, um, though, of course, there's still things going on, Judah in Berlin, wasn't there? And there was the, uh, what was happening there? Um, so that aspect was less relevant. But what it did do is get, it got me into medical physics, biomedical engineering, and in particular into imaging. Um, but my project actually wasn't in imaging at all. Um, it was playing with this wonderful uh, piece of equipment. Can you, can you see my cursor on the screen? Uh, does that uh, come yes, up? Yes, we can. Um, yes. So I was actually playing with something called a cyclotron, and this was one of the um, earlier cyclotrons uh, built in 1948. It actually carried on um, until 1999. I was playing with it in 1976, and I did some rather sort of scary experiments with large amounts of radiation um, and came up with my first paper. So there it is, my very first paper. Um, look, it got nine citations. Um, and I'm sure most of those citations were self citations by the, uh, not from me, but by the other two, uh, the other three people on the author list. And um, when everything says a preliminary investigation, as we now know, that means it doesn't work. Uh, th th this didn't work. Uh, and so uh, um, it, uh, it, it never really went anywhere, but it, but it did get me a paper. Um, and then I had to decide what I was going to do next, I had to um, get a job. Um, so that masters, um, I say, opened my eyes to medical physics and I got a job as a medical physicist. Um, so it started off being in this rather old dilapidated building in Southampton. In the three years I was there, um, it was replaced by this brand new building, which was rather nice. And I was started working in nuclear medicine. Um, but my main reason for doing this is because um, although I was interested in medical imaging, my primary interest uh, was in playing in a band at that time, and I needed to earn some money um, in order to keep my hobby going. Um, and so there we were, the lesser known Tunisians, and, uh, and we kept going for three years. Um, as all good things sort of come to an end, um, the band split up, um, and, so we, and we sort of had to restart our various careers. And I decided I needed to do a PhD. At that time, I decided, well, actually, from that early... Um, time learning about medical imaging in uh, radiobiology. Um, of course, I learned how a CT scanner worked. Um, and for those of you who know, CT scanning first became clinically uh, used in about 1971, if I remember rightly. Actually, I think the first scan was in 69. So it was still relatively new at that time. And um, I enjoyed mathematics. And what inspired me to get into medical imaging was I'm um, going through the radon transform or filter back projection and just about three lines of mathematics enables you to take a set of projections and turn them into an image so you could actually look inside somebody. And I thought that was really cool. Uh, and I wanted to see what else one could do um, in that area. Um, so I went to University of Surrey in Guildford in south, uh, um, just south of London and at the Royal Marsden Hospital, which is the main cancer hospital um, in London. 
Um, and I was under the direction of this wonderful lady, Daphne Jackson, who's, uh, at least in the UK, is very well known. She's a um, formidable lady, a very bright scientist, um, and she's very, very keen at pushing um, women into science and so has, um, I think, an international reputation in that area as well as in her own um, science. But she was my supervisor. I spent most of my time disagreeing with her and um, realising that most of the time I was, uh, she was right. Uh, so I, I learned a lot from Daphne. Um, but we had great fun working at the Marsden, and I worked on the world's first, um, whoops, um, uh, EMI CT scanner, the CT5005, uh, built by EMI, who um, built the very first CT scanner. Um, and um, here is a picture of it, uh, taken from the EMI brochure at the time. And the beauty of this is that in the evenings, I could get, if you had a decent toolkit with spanners and um, screwdrivers, you could take it to bits. Um, and so I took it to bits in the evenings and I sort of played around with the detectors on there and I turned it into a dual energy CT scanner. Um, and you just cannot do that now. You're not allowed to do that now. It's a you breach all sorts of regulatory approvals uh, for this to be used clinically. And um, but I did that, I think for about six months, I was taking it to uh, pieces every evening and put it back together again the next day. And it was only once um, that that failed. And when at uh, eight o'clock in the morning, they started scanning, it didn't work. And of course I was blamed. Um, in fact, the reason that the, the scanner had broken for a totally independent reason, of course, I still got the blame for it. Um, and then one paper came out of that. Uh, this was more linked to Daphne Jackson's work, X-ray attenuation coefficients of elements and mixtures. Um, which got cited a bit when it first produced, but I've been rather pleased looking back into Google Scholar um, that it got um, well over half its citation for the last 10 years and has formed the basis for quite a lot of the dual energy CT scanning uh, that's been going on in the last decade. And so it's quite pleased and unexpected. So things sometimes take quite a long time to uh, mature. And I think that's a story that um, sort of goes through. But anyway, at the end of that, I finished my PhD in 1981. Um, and um, I was actually looking for postdoc positions in the UK and going back to some politics. This was third year of Margaret Thatcher being in, um, in power here in the UK. And she stopped most of the science funding. There was hardly any postdoc positions. Um, so I very nearly went to, to Canada um, uh, to work in, Mont in, in Toronto. Uh, but actually I stayed on and I became a, a clinical scientist again tempted to St. George's Hospital in South London, um, where, um, uh, or associated with St. George's, was Atkinson Morley Hospital, which is where the world's first CT scanner uh, was um, installed. And um, the radiologist, Jamie Ambrose, and John Perry, um, who's a medical physicist, were still working in this hospital. Godfrey Hansfield was nearby. Um, uh, so he was still working on research at um, EMI. Um, and so, I enjoyed um, talking to um, all three of those people who were on the very first um, CT scanning paper um, to, to get a little bit about sort of uh, what that experience was like. But it was a routine job. Um, and although I did do a little bit of research there, I was getting very frustrated at not being able to do um, um, uh, research activity in this area. Um, and so um, rescued by Adam Colchester, I'll come back to him in a sec, I moved to this place. Um, and um, I think when, Julia, when you arrived at Guy's, I think Guy's Hospital did still look like that. For those it still looks know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's got a rather large building here called the Shard. Um, so you can hardly see Guy's Hospital. Um, Guy's Hospital was said to have the best view in London uh, from the top here because it was the only place in London where you couldn't see Guy's Hospital. Um, uh, so we, um, I moved there. And um, I started working uh, with a interesting gentleman who I hope, yes, here he is. So on the right hand of this little blow up here, um, um, there's somebody you might recognize, that's Alan Colchester. That's Alan Colchester. We organized ITME in 1993, which was great fun. Um, so nearly 20 years ago. So that's what Alan Colchester looked like uh, 20, uh, 30 years ago. Um, and I don't think he's aged at all, actually. I think he's done quite well. There's somebody else who just happened to be sitting, standing next to him. Do you recognize that person, Julia? Yeah, another boss of mine, Max, Max Vergeber. Max Vergeber. <laughs> Max Vergeber. I think he was 
probably just finished the post off at that time. And I think it was just about to start it, start it retract, if, if I remember rightly. Um, and if you look around here, there's some other names um, who are quite familiar to the, uh, uh, to, to, to the discipline, um, but, but I won't go through all those now. So anyway, they we were at Kai's and um, set up by Mike Macy this project to see what we could do with all these different images. We had a number of different imaging modalities available. And the thought occurred that if we could bring them into alignment, uh, then we might be able to say, get some more information out of those, um, 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 those, those images co-aligned. Um, so the image registration projects were started. It took quite a long time. So in the previous slide, I showed I moved in 1989, 1988 to guide. So it was about six years getting going. Um, I was fortunate to have Derek Hill as uh, one of my first PhD students. Actually, I think he was my first PhD student, then followed by Colin Studholm. Um, and I think this is one thing about scientific careers is perhaps not everybody, but I think um, most of us, there's a sort of eureka moment that you have uh, during your research and you sort of discover something or spot something um, um, in such a way that you think, ah, right, here's something I can really fly with. And we were trying to register MR and CT scans um, uh, for some surgical planning work that we were doing uh, with the neurosurgeons. And here are example images shown. Um, and it occurred that you could plot the intensity of one against the intensity of the other, i.e. get a joint probability distribution of image intensities. And I played around as with Colin, I think, at the time, and saying, well, let's take these two images, let's get a probability distribution at um, alignment, and then let's see what happens if we just misalign slightly. So this one's only misaligned by about one or two millimeters. And whoa, <laughs> can you hear that? That's a, <laughs> a very fast, low-flying jet has just gone by. <laughs> I'm quite near to a Navy base here, and they sometimes do that. So, oh, that's a bit worrying. Isn't it? They're, they're obviously practicing. <laughs> I don't think they're aiming for me. Um, <laughs> right, sorry about that interruption. Um, usually they go in pairs. There might be another one coming along in a, in a minute. Um, anyway, where was I saying? Yeah, so here we are looking at the joint probability distributions um, at misalignment. And so there's quite a major change in this um, intensity patterns. And we were starting to think of ways that we could um, capture that. And so we measured the joint entropy of that distribution. Um, and so Derek Hill presented a paper at uh, BBC, one of the precursor meetings to Mikai in uh, 1994, which showed this. The joint um, entropy wasn't particularly robust as a registration um, uh, measure. But um, we had Andre Collignol from Leuven and we had Sandy Wells from MIT, both in the audience. And they both looked at those images and said, we know what measure is needed. And so they came up with relative entropy or um, mutual information, one being the negation of the other. And that produced a robust um, image registration for this multimodal data. Um, and in a way, you can say that the rest is history. Um, but there's a series of um, really very highly cited um, publications came from us, but also from the Mervyn Group and from um, MIT, uh, which established image registration, um, uh, the automated image registration as a, um, as a useful clinical tool. We were then, um, oh, and, and this just shows some of the um, uh, images that were generated at the time. Can't get all these movies working, there we go. Um, so this is bringing together two types of MRI and a CT scan and then with volume rendering the two together. And I think these, um, I, I still think these are, are, are very pretty images. Um, um, obviously the image quality is better now, uh, but it shows what we could do with that multimodal data. And in particular, look at the relationship between the bony structures, uh, the soft tissue of the lesion there, um, so acoustic neuroma and the, and the feeding um, blood vessels. Um, and um, that also got us into um, image guided surgery, which I'll come to in a sec. But then, um, uh, Danny, who I think is on the call, um, uh, uh, joined our lab. And um, um, one thing about Danny Rukert, who's been um, very successful, and one of the reasons for his success is he does what he thinks is important and what he wants to do. He doesn't do what he was told. He was employed to be on a completely different um, uh, project, but he spotted 
what we'd done with the image registration, the mutual information, and took some of the work that he'd been doing with um, beast blinds and put the two together to um, provide a non-rigid uh, registration which proved to be very robust with many applications. The applications we're looking at at the time were in the breast, and these are subtraction images from a lady who's lying in an MR scanner. Um, so these images are actually upside down. Um, and the uh, one on the left uh, is showing the subtraction of an enhanced, uh, of a, um, the, the pre-contrast image um, subtracted from the enhanced image after injection of gadolinium. Um, and you can see there's a lot of subtraction artifacts in there. And that's cleaned up beautifully in the um, uh, image shown on the right. I think both Danny and I have shown this set of images so many times, it's probably unlikely to wear out soon. But anyway, I still think they're stunning images. And that started off the um, work we were doing in non-rigid registration. And, and again, uh, led to some highly cited papers. I checked, Danny, if you're on the call, uh, Google Scholar this morning, 6,010 citations. So we've gone through 6,000 citations. Hey. <laughs> right. Um, as I said just now, sorry about this fairly gory picture. We, um, um, when I was starting to do this work on looking at the different images and how they might be brought together, um, I thought at the time what we needed to do, perhaps with these images, was to use them to guide surgery and to guide interventions, not just for diagnosis. So in the early 1990s, um, we made contact uh, with a wonderful scientist, Frank Gertsen, um, who uh, some of you may uh, remember, um, who was um, working on the um, Easy School project at uh, Phillips Medical Systems in um, Eindhoven, I think it was. Um, and um, so we started a collaboration with him and he was building uh, one of the first commercial um, image guided surgery systems, the Easy, um, Easy Vision system. Um, and this shows, <coughs> excuse me, this shows it in practice. So here we have an MR scan on the left showing a, there's a little aneurysm there at the back of the, uh, just in front of the spine in the, the back of the throat. And here's a pointer uh, pointing at towards the lesion as seen on the MR scan, but here it is pointed physically actually within the patient. And so having got a registration between these two, you, you then got a means of guidance. Um, and this was, certainly wasn't the only example of this at the time, um, but this was one of the commercial systems. Sadly, Philips never went on to commercialize, um, but it got through um, regulatory approval and various clinical trials um, to prove um, that it worked and it was useful. Um, and then uh, now, um, Julia says that Eddie is on the call. So Eddie will remember this. Um, again, this is a slide I've shown many, many times. And so is Eddie, and this might wear out eventually if it's been shown too many times. But this is peering into a surgical procedure, which is a removal of an acoustic neuroma. This is shown in blue here, and this is the mapping of the MRI segmented lesion onto the field of view of the stereo microscope, um, as shown uh, uh, with Tony Strong, our surgeon, looking into the patient on the view on the right. And although technically there was nothing particularly new about this, um, it was just bringing together bits of technology, it was still a very nice example. Um, published in 2000, um, of how we might uh, combine an augmented reality system, either the surgical microscope uh, with the image aligned uh, technology. Um, and again, I think it's quite interesting seeing how this has developed. We had a collaboration with Leica at the time. They decided that it, um, they didn't want to invest in uh, putting uh, this um, through to product and they passed the project on um, to, um, oh, I've got their name now, uh, Brainlab, uh, the, the, the company who uh, just by you in, um, in Munich, I believe. Um, and so they had the project for a while, but they didn't really see a strong market for it. So I, I'm not sure if it actually got marketed, um, um, but then it was sort of put to one side. But now, um, much re more recently, you know, about 10 years later, our products started to become available, which we're using very, um, very closely related technology. So there's something there about doing research, and then when is the sweet spot, the right time to actually push it into uh, something that can be um, clinically developed and um, more widely um, disseminated and distributed. And I think we might have learned some lessons there, but it's still great fun to be doing that project. But so this brings me to the next slide and the realization, I think I started using this slide at that time, 
um, to really make a difference in uh, clinical work, uh, we have to um, have, there's three parts of what we're looking at. Um, so there is the um, um, us in the academic imaging groups um, in the university sector. Um, there's a medical engineering industry, um, such as um, you know, the Likers and the Lecters and the Siemens and the Philips and so on. Um, and then there's the healthcare providers, so those who are running the hospitals and providing healthcare. And we really need to get that triangle working. And we're, I started really pushing that at that time. Now, um, step forward three or four years and another big move. So this time, um, I decided to move, or actually it wasn't me, it was a consensus of a number of people working what was then called CISG, the Computational Image Science Group, uh, to uh, UCL. KCL at that time, um, and it changed its view on this just a year or two later, um, decided that it wasn't going to invest in biomedical, uh, in, uh, biomedical engineering and um, image computing. Um, so that was very frustrating for us. Um, so we decided to move it to UCL, where there was already a lot of activity in this area, and we slotted in very nicely into medical physics and computer science. Um, and that was 30 people. It seemed like a lot of people at the time. Um, so it was a reasonable sized lab. Um, but of course, um, by 10 years after that, 2015, it, it had increased the size to about 100 people. Um, and so, um, one thing that we could do at UCL, which I felt I couldn't do back at Guy's, is to complete that triangle. Um, so we have here the CMIC, which we formed. A bit later, we have the Wellcome Trust Center for Interventional Sciences. Um, we had the Institute of Healthcare Ed, um, Engineering, uh, which was a sort of cross-faculty um, institute at UCL. And we had UCL Partners, which is all the hospitals, the academic hospitals that we collaborated with in, in North London. And we're able to bring that together. And the other thing we're able to do uh, it's sort of fairly boring, I guess, but it's so important, is that we started taking seriously compliance with the regulatory environment um, and really enabling first in man and clinical trial of the technology that we were trying to develop. And it was so important to get all that picture um, together uh, to really have an impact. Um, and then much more recently, um, so this, I think we started doing this in about 2015, um, and then this was led by Seb Ursulan, who, who I'm sure many of you know, um, who's now at KCL. Um, and um, we wanted to produce a new institute, a new um, facility, including laboratories and space for researchers that was close to the university, but also close to um, uh, the, um, uh, the hospitals that we're working with. And so an opportunity came up to uh, renovate an old building um, that um, satisfied those requirements. It's about a kilometre away from the university and about a kilometre away uh, from, the, uh, from our main hospital. Um, and so it's called uh, Charles Bell House, named after a prominent surgeon of this 18th century. Um, and um, we got three of the five floors of that building. Um, and we also got quite a substantial amount of money to um, um, renovate, to um, turn that building into the sort of laboratory that we wanted. Um, and so the Y Centre, we got a big grant from Wellcome and the EPSRC and the Y Centre was, um, uh, was formed. And now looking at the reports, um, I, so Seb left, moved to KCL just as it was being formed. Um, I then led it um, just as an interim um, measure for uh, one year or 18 months. Uh, before handing over to Dan Stoyanov, who's now the um, director. And he's uh, very successfully built that up to about 200 affiliated researchers. He's, he's gained about 100 million in, in research funding, that's 100 million um, pounds, uh, which is about the same as 100 million euros, isn't it, at the moment, I think. Um, and um, it has um, you know, started 21 clinical trials and 550 uh, peer-reviewed publications. Um, acknowledging the center. So it's really become quite a major operation and we're very proud of that. So we have a number of clinical collaborators that won't go through all these. Um, uh, and we have, um, it's currently, we keep on changing the structure um, because I think one thing is to be fairly dynamic about how that's done and to sort of use what works and stop doing what doesn't work. So it's got 11 research groups around particular uh, clinical applications. It's got 10 technology platforms. And so I think the same with you in Munich. It's, it's how you can match 
a similar piece of technology to a number of different clinical applications. And the particular clinical applications needs to take in a number of different technologies in order to make it work um, in this area. So um, uh, the key thing, I guess, which enabled us to get the funding and we really wanted to push is to use this center to um, get through this translational gap. You know, this is what's happening in the uh, uh, university sector, the first four stages, um, or in the research labs of industry. Um, and then this is what's happening in the, um, um, in, the, in the healthcare providers. And there's this sort of gap here, which we wanted to fill the translational gap. Now, what I'm going to do, what I've, I reckon I've got about, what, 20 minutes left, something like that. Um, so um, I'm, I'm just gonna run quickly through two applications which I've been closely involved with, just to show where we've got to and what's happening now and what might happen in the future and what some of the pitfalls that we've had and how we've tried to overcome some of them and what we haven't managed to overcome yet. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is image-guided laparoscopic liver surgery. So this is primarily to remove liver metastases from the liver. These arise from the bowel, from bowel cancer. Um, in the UK, it's the second highest cause of cancer death. Um, so uh, incidence of 66 per 100,000, death of 28 per 100,000. And you just look at, that's what, about half, just under half of that. It's a pretty nasty cancer. Right? A lot of people don't survive. And although there are um, therapeutic, um, there's, uh, there's drug-related, you know, immune-related uh, therapies that are coming along, um, they're not um, yet in mainstream use. And currently resection, surgical resection is, provides the only possibility of cure. Um, what we'd like to do is rather than cut the patient open, and it's a brutal surgery, I've seen several of these, um, to remove a metastasis from, from the liver with a, um, a very long recovery time for the patient. And it really is quite, um, it can leave the patient in a lot of pain with a very large scar. I uh, want to try and make these laparoscopic. Now you're going through small holes in the abdomen. Um, and in the UK, I think we might be lagging behind um, many countries in Europe, but uh, at the moment, only about 10% of cases are done by laparoscopic resection. And the idea was that by providing better um, computational and imaging support, um, that we could encourage more of these procedures to go laparoscopic so that the surgeon has a better um, idea of what's going on given the restricted field of view of the laparoscope. Right, so um, when we started on this work, I think I was actually uh, collaborating with Nasser on this, um, um, on a European project uh, run by the um, IHU in Strasbourg. Um, we had some developed stereo um, laparoscope system here with a small um, stereo camera here um, and with a bit of um, fast reconstruction technology running on a, what was then a fast GPU, um, we were able, this is what, 10 years ago now, um, we were able to um, construct um, surface patches of the liver um, at about three, um, three times a second, um, um, which was enough for application. That encouraged us to start building um, a, an image card and laparoscopic surgery system. The next part of the jigsaw um, is that, if I get this movie, oh, it is going, there we are. Um, so this is actually a picture on a, from a pig experiment that we were doing. So it's inside a, a, um, a porcine model. So it's a pig liver here. We've got a laparoscopic ultrasound system here. It's got little markers you can see on that. And that's how we were tracking it optically at that time. And this is after registration to a segmented CT scan, um, showing how we can find where the sweep of the ultrasound is in relation to that by matching up the blood vessels. So we were primarily looking at the um, bifurcations of the, uh, of the vasculature um, and matching those between ultrasound and CT. But highly interactive, and although it worked, uh, we could get a registration, it wasn't really practical for um, a routine clinical use. Um, but we put together a system because we wanted to show how we could integrate a system and actually get something working on patients. So this is our system. Um, we were tracking um, the ultrasound probe and the uh, laparoscope. Uh, with uh, light reflecting um, markers um, bolted onto the devices, tracked on the camera here. So a fairly conventional technology, um, but we did integrate it all together um, so that we could provide the surgeon with overlays looking like this. So it's a bit dark on here, um, but you can just make out the outline of the liver. And here are the, um, 
uh, that's the uh, hepatic artery, and I think it's the portal vein shown in blue on, on there, um, and likewise on these videos. So these are videos, if I remember rightly, on actual patients, not on the pig model. Um, and we ran this on um, about five or six patients to prove that we had got something that could be translated into um, uh, clinical practice. But although we achieved sufficient registration, there was a lot wrong with this system. It couldn't really be used routinely clinically. We had a lot of um, segmentation tasks that required quite close supervision from an expert, from a radiologist. And when we were doing the registration in the operating room, it required a, um, an engineer present to help the surgeon or the nurse or the technician uh, to uh, make the system work, to cajole it into producing a reasonable registration. So that's when we come up to something much more recent. So this is just looking at the last two or three years now for this technology. So I'm less involved um, with this now, but I, I offer advice from afar, as they say. Um, but this shows how a um, deep learning paradigm can help us to identify automatically where the liver outline is in the um, surgical scene. So this is a series of uh, clinical video sequences, and this shows um, stepping through. So this, this is the expert marking. Um, so this is our, our gold standard. Um, this is uh, trained on a relatively small number of um, patient data sets, though each data set has a lot of videos, uh, video images within it. Um, and then what we've done, not we've done, um, people who are in the lab now um, have uh, generated a large amount of synthetic data by taking um, the video data that's acquired and from it generating more synthetic data and using that to develop a much more robust system. So this is looking now pretty robust and it was um, presented last year in IJ cars. Um, another part of the story is what do you do with it? If we're going to use the ultrasound as the primary registration technique, um, we need to be able to automate the identification of blood vessels in those ultrasound views. It sounds a fairly straightforward thing because you see quite good contrast on the uh, uh, laparoscopic ultrasound, but to get that robust is very, very hard work. Um, so the system that was used clinically, as I showed a couple of slides back, um, that was hand identification of the, um, of the vascular structures, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's totally impractical to use this in routine healthcare. Um, but with the, uh, um, with the deep learning technique and developed by Nina Montana Brown, um, um, she was able to show with reasonable success uh, the identification of the vascular structures separated between the hepatic um, artery system and the portal vein system um, identified in the, um, in the images. And this just shows um, true positives, false and, and false positives uh, for both the venous and the um, um, arterial system. So this is pretty good but it's probably not quite good enough yet. So this needs to be made more robust. Um, and maybe it's just more data that we require or, or, or some more thinking, but it's part of the components of putting together the system. But this is the uh, thing which I'm most excited about at the moment. And this is by um, this is the PhD project of um, Ajar Ramanina, um, who um, came up with the idea of using content-based retrieval of the vascular features um, and use those to map the ultrasound to the, um, um, the liver. Now, I'll try and explain this because I think it's quite an interesting but quite difficult to explain concept. If you take a single slice of ultrasound and try and register it, you probably do have some ultrasound views where there's a unique um, um, combination, um, sorry, there's a new, unique plane through the liver which matches that ultrasound, but it's quite hard to find it. If you look at how uh, ultrasound is used in clinical practice, of course, it's never a single slice. The observer is sweeping the ultrasound through the object, um, whether it be for diagnosis or for, in this case, for the image guidance during surgery. Um, so what Jiao came up with was a, well, let's take a sequence of five video images. It could be more than that, but he, he chose five. Um, and if we make the assumption that those five video images are collected in a smooth sequence of probes, so you're only moving the ultrasound probe smoothly and in roughly the same direction, um, then that 
provides some sort of constraint to what you've got and you can order the images that you're getting. And then what he was able to show is that you could take those five images and you could match them together to the uh, CT scan. You've got no assumption about the rigidity of this pseudo volume that you're creating from the, uh, um, from, from the liver, only that you've got a sequence of images that are collected sequentially. And so there's a progression through space of them. Um, and with that, he was able to show that you get an accuracy of registration on, it's only, um, I think he only looked at five patients. Um, um, so between 5.7 or 16 millimeters. Now that, for those of us working in image registration, that doesn't sound too good, but if you think of the size of the liver, so the liver is sort of about that big, um, it means you're getting into the right ballpark. And you can see here the right ballpark of these slices shown through a rendering of the, um, of the, um, of the CT scan of the liver. Um, it's not wonderfully robust, so we've got about 78% success rate. So. 22 times out of 100 is going to fail. Um, but it's something to work on. And the interesting thing about this is you don't need a tracker. So with this, you could have an ultrasound probe, the laparoscope, they both still have to be connected together, um, but that's relatively easy to do. And you have a preoperative CT scan. Um, and then bringing those together, we could provide image guidance if we can provide a good way of um, uh, giving that information to the surgeon um, within sufficient tolerance to be um, clinically useful. And I think this could um, be a, a game changer in introducing this technology into clinical practice. The system I showed three or four slides ago, which we put through uh, five or six patients on, is impractical to use routinely. Something like this might actually change the way this happens. Now I'm just going to um, I've got about 10 minutes. I'm, I'm buying more minutes off you, Julia, aren't I? <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> so I'm going to go through the <coughs> prostate story and then that's me pretty well finished. Um, so this is, this is actually something which I think has really has had an impact already in um, our clinical practice, um, but there is still some uh, pitfalls and problems that need to be resolved. And this started about the time that we moved to uh, UCL, um, we set up a collaboration with Mark Emberton, who's the urologist um, dealing with prostate cancer at UCH. Um, and he was convinced um, that MRI could change the way that prostate cancer is diagnosed and treated. Up until then, um, men would have a PSA scan, um, or if they have symptoms, um, they would then have a, maybe a rectal examination, they would then go to biopsy, which is randomly sticking needles into the prostate, which, uh, believe me, is incredibly painful. Um, and then um, if they found a cancer, the patient would go for um, having it removed surgically, prostatectomy or maybe radiotherapy. So he started this trial. Um, um, so this is Hash Ahmed, who was one of his uh, clinical research fellows who became first author of the subsequent Lancet paper. And it's called the PROMISE trial, and this did change what happened. We weren't involved in this, so we're helping out a little bit. This was already set up. They took 576 men uh, with PSA raised, but less than 15, uh, did multi-parametric MRI, so that's three different sequences of MRI combined. And then they did this um, uh, transperineal mapping biopsy. I'll show a diagram of that in the next slide to sample the prostate um, over a very fine grid. Uh, to find out if there really is cancer there. And they came up with these results. 40% um, had clinically significant disease, which means Gleason greater than or equal to four, um, uh, four plus three, plus at least, I think it's five millimeters of um, cancer. They showed that multi-parametric multi MRI is 93% sensitive. Comparing that with the standard biopsy, which was done before, that was only 48%. So they're missing half the cancers on the, um, on the biopsy. And so with this, they were able to show 27% of patients might avoid biopsy altogether because there's no cancer there showing up on the MRI. They did miss 5%, um, but that all 17 patients had low-grade uh, cancer. So it may not have been um, uh, life-threatening to them. Um, whoops. No, um, and... Uh, What's more, they're able to detect 18% uh, more clinically significant cancers um, uh, with the um, MRI. 
So MRI looked as though it was the way to go and has now become clinical routine pretty well around the world um, um, as part of the patient workflow for um, detecting prostate cancer. So what we wanted to do was be able to um, see if we could provide an image guidance system given the MRI so you could biopsy the target that is picked up on the MRI and if appropriate to then uh, treat it. Um, and so uh, Mark Edmonton was using this system here. It's actually from uh, brachytherapy for placement of uh, radioactive um, 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 sources uh, within the prostate for radiotherapy, um, but it was adapted to the biopsy tie. So it's, it looks fairly unpleasant and it's unpleasant, but not painful. A rectal probe passes through here, scanning the uh, prostate. And then there's a grid here, which gives you an addressing system and where to take the uh, biopsy of the uh, prostate. And the, what we needed to do to be able to direct this accurately was to take the MRI, um, take the ultrasound. This is an actual ultrasound. The, because of the presence of the probe and the position of the patient and so on and so forth, there might be quite significant distortion between the ultrasound and the MRI, or between the prostate and the ultrasound and the MRI. And so um, um, uh, Yi Peng Hu, um, who was then a PhD student, is now a, an academic within our group, uh, came up with a novel registration algorithm that enabled us to get um, reasonable um, um, registration accuracy for, uh, which was, was the core of this image guidance system. So we take the MRI, um, we segment out the uh, prostate, um, and then the def deformation modeling of the um, insertion of the probe and anything else that might change uh, the prostate was modeled using finite element techniques. And he ran that maybe about a thousand times on this sequence and enabled to get a parameterization of those deformation fields. So with just a relatively small number of extra degrees of freedom, um, was able to then distort the um, um, MRI to map it onto the um, ultrasound. And you could do that with about you know, an accuracy of about two and a half millimeters, um, uh, which was good enough for clinical application. Um, he then took it one step further and say, well, if you start looking at lots of patients, they were starting to do this on a large um, um, series of patients at UCH. Um, so when you're up to about 100, you could collect um, the deformations of all 100 prostates and build that with a statistical deformation model. Um, and then um, when you do the analysis of that, so that gives us what we call a generative um, statistical motion model. Um, and then when a new patient comes in, we use that as a constraint, so from the previous data, and we can still achieve the same accuracy. So um, um, the, that went to clinical trial, 129 men. I think they were selected from a promise trial, if I remember rightly. Um, all, they all had a discrete lesion, uh, Gleason score three to five. Um, and what they found is that just doing the um, by eye guidance compared with the using the machine to guide uh, the, our registration system, um, they were both able to detect 93 of these 129. But it was a different 90, uh, uh, sorry, they were each able to detect 80 of those 129. No, I'm still got that wrong. It's a while since I looked at that slide. They were able to get 80 of the 93 cancers. There was a different 80 on the manual system versus the uh, automated system that we had. Um, but together, all the cancers were, um, um, we were able to um, locate. Um, so that formed the basis of a product called Smart Target. Um, and that is, uh, was put through regulatory approval. Uh, this is by, um, so Dean Barrett was the leader of the group then, um, and um, that is still there, um, having been terribly successful uh, commercially, um, but it's looking as though they're going to be developing it some more, and we'll see what happens. Um, and then, again, coming up to um, the present day, there's still things about it which are not right, um, and is in, acting as an impediment to clinical translation. One is, um, as shown on this um, diagram, most urologists don't use such a system. What they do is they have a single probe here and the probe has a side firing needle that goes in to the prostate um, in order to take a sample. And they don't flap around with this rather more cumbersome um, uh, system for getting an accurate mapping. So this just produces a 
um, an ultrasound scan, which you want to have registered in real time uh, to the MRI. Um, and so um, uh, Zach Baum has recently developed a deep neural network architecture for doing a real time uh, registration, um, non rigid registration of the point set from the um, outline of the prostate as seen on the ultrasound to the previously segmented um, um, MRI. Oops. Um, then the other intriguing thing is that when we're building these models, um, it's quite important to have some idea about the quality that is going into the models that you're, you're doing your learning from. And this is particularly true of the ultrasound and the ultrasound of the prostate. Um, so uh, Saeed uh, reported at ITME last year, um, has developed this concept of task amenability. Uh, so it's some measure of how well the, what the image quality is um, when you're feeding this into the model. There's times when you want to have a model when you want to be feeding data in a poor quality to improve the robustness of your model. And there's times where you really do need to have high quality data going in. And so this is quite an interesting take on that. Right, I'm going to skip this. It's really interesting, but you'll have to invite me back again to go through <laughs> this bit because I'm now going to summarize with just a couple of wrap up slides. So um, sort of story of where we've done. When I started um, work in academia, working with industry was almost a dirty word. Um, and this is certainly in the UK, maybe different in Germany. Um, and the idea of a postdoc or a PhD student or even academic member of staff starting up a company to try and exploit their work, that was sort of seen as something that was like sort of cooperating with the devil. Um, and I think we've seen a dramatic change in certainly in biomedical engineering, and I think it's going across all engineering. It's certainly going across all computer science now. You know, this working um, with entrepreneurship and with large industry in a collaborative and cooperative and trusted way um, has been very successful. So I'm fortunate and in the last, what, 10 years or maybe 15 years, to have been working uh, with setting up quite a lot of uh, companies, um, some of which like Vision RT have been very successful. Now the others like Ixico, which Daniel Rupert will know about, um, it's still there, the, 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 the company hasn't folded. Um, and then there's other ones like um, Odin Vision are coming along really well. Um, previous uh, uh, PhD and postdoc, uh, Graham Penny from uh, UCL, from KCL days, uh, set up Cider um, Medical on something we were doing back in the, uh, to in, in the uh, late 1990s and so on and so forth. And this, this is really great fun. And there's now in London, and I'm sure it's the same in Munich, um, there's a really vibrant way of getting academics, um, entrepreneurs, industry, uh, venture capital companies, sources of finance to sort of work together uh, to um, uh, really push, you know, people make money out of this, um, sure, and that may be the primary motivation for some. But the key thing about this, we, we get stuff into clinical practice this way. And it um, really has made a big difference. We can take these companies, they all have different paths. Some will fail, just disappear. But sometimes the pieces are picked up by somebody else and the technology continues. Um, uh, but they get into clinical practice and they get widely disseminated. Um, and then <clears throat> last, <coughs> I made a mistake of eating a biscuit just before I gave this talk, and that's a crumb from the biscuit. Um, we've all had to deal with COVID and the pandemic. And I just wanted to tell one very quick story of um, something that we did at UCL um, to try and deal with the, um, um, some of the practical problems associated with the pandemic. And this is not a medical imaging project at all, but it is from the Institute of Healthcare Engineering and the White Centre. And it just shows, <clears throat> excuse me, it just shows what can be done um, if everybody is focused on making a difference quickly. Um, and I think there's lessons that might be learned for how we might translate some of that te technology to more resource poor environments. And there's lessons to be learned where he really wants to save patients' lives on how we can speed up the process. Um, so this was, to develop a CPAP, a continuous positive airway pressure um, mask for delivering oxygen to patients who are um, 
got very severe pneumonia and, and need oxygen. And it's a way of trying to avoid them being intubated where the tubes put down their throat and they have to be anesthetized. Um, so this device has been around for ages, um, but it's a bit cumbersome and complicated and expensive and there weren't many of these systems around. Now, when the pandemic, so I can remember that, was it March the 24th, was it 2020, if I remember rightly, everything suddenly closed down in the UK. And I think it's the same across Europe. Um, and um, it so happened that Mercedes Formula One team, uh, Mercedes AMG, were coll collaborating with the mechanical engineering team at um, UCL on Formula One cars, you know, fine tuning the, uh, the engines and so on and so forth. Um, and they suddenly finished up being what we call in the UK furloughed. They couldn't carry on working. So there's a team of about 30 or 40 people there. Um, they were used to engineering very, very quickly. Um, um, new modifications to the Formula One cars. Um, they also had expertise in um, uh, fluid flow uh, because that's what, that was what you need in internal combustion engines. So their chief engineer worked with Becky Shipley, who's an engineer in um, the Institute of Healthcare Engineering, so actually a mathematical modeler, and with an intensive care um, um, physician um, who said, we really need these CPAPs and we need them fast and we need them cheap. They reverse engineered a billet system that was out of um, patent. So, you know, these, I say, these have been out for a long time and just synthesized what's the bare minimum you need of this device. And using their rapid prototype technology that Mercedes had, um, they built um, in 100 hours, they went from having that meeting with the um, um, intensive care physician to having a work, working prototype. And that's 100 hours of working 24 hours a day um, with their team. They got in touch with the MHRA, the UK Health Regulatory Body. And because they were on board and they wanted to move quickly, they got it through regulatory approval in 10 days, which I think is quite remarkable. And then uh, most importantly, and the UCL team were uh, insistent on this, the design went open source. So they open sourced the design. Um, um, and they produced, um, with the Mercedes manufacturing facilities, they were producing one stage a thousand a day. Um, and they also um, had um, a large number of countries worldwide are now starting to produce this because they're not difficult to buy. So um, it showed how we got a bit of engineering into clinic really, really quickly, if you know where the barriers are and everybody is determined to overcome those barriers, which I think is interesting. Um, it's not all, you know, the story isn't all roses because actually this device leaks oxygen and it uses up um, a lot of oxygen. So when they started introducing it in resource poor countries, I think it's in Pakistan there's the problem, um, they actually used up all the oxygen in the hospital using these devices. And so there had to be a bit more engineering then to uh, make sure that the seal around the, the face mask was better so that they, um, they, they didn't use up more oxygen. But anyway, um, that I thought was an interesting story. So here's me now. I'm, I'm now emeritus professor at UCL. So I'm still doing some work. Um, some of those projects I talked about, I'm still involved with, but I do have time to do other things. I've retrained as a bus driver and it's great. I've always wanted to drive a bus. Um, and so I'm now the bus driver for the local community bus. I take everybody in uh, from, pick them up in the local villages because there's no public transport system and take them in to do the shopping. I really enjoy sailing even in the rain. So I do that. We also have um, you know, down here in Devon, the sun always shines. And so we're growing lots of fruit and vegetables, but I still keep in touch with um, what's going on. And so top right here, that was just before the pandemic, we did a um, um, quite an exciting presentation at the Science Museum uh, to try and explain to small children um, what it is we do in the wide center and, uh, and, and great fun by all. Um, and I hope to be continuing doing that. So I think that's me done. Acknowledgements on that slide. And so thank you very much, Julia. <laughs> thank you so much, Dave.